Fine, if no one else will say it, I will. Game development looks hard. Making a game is a sometimes years long endeavor that has every chance in the world to make the next big innovation that people talk about for years. You hear that, Boom Blocks? This could be you. But that gamble has such a heavy cost. So many things can go wrong when developing a game that any number of things can make for a rough development cycle. From budgetary restrictions, strict deadlines, uncooperative partners, Anything can, and probably will, go wrong. It makes sense, then, that any one of these things can make a developer feel bitter about their work. Games are often passion projects by extremely devoted people, and if the product they get to show off isn't up to their standards or has some bad memories tied to it, it's no wonder they'd end up hating the finished product. That's what we're talking about today, games that their developers hated making. These are projects that at some point lost the popularity vote with their own parents, and are looked back on as sore spots by the people who made them. Now, it's hard to pinpoint games which were universally hated by the work staff. Developers are hesitant to call out a project as a stinker publicly, since, good game or not, that's still a portfolio piece. All right, sir, we've been through your resume, and it says that the last game you worked on sucked d and what part did you have to play in that? You think the team behind Ride to Hell was all sunshine and rainbows? Nobody animating this had a smile on their face, but they aren't gonna come out and say it. Sometimes it takes digging a little deeper, or for a game's development to be blown wide open before we learn about its developmental woes. Other times, devs can't wait to talk about how much they hate a project. Yeah, the sound mixer was a tattletale, the level designer stole my lunch money, the project lead eats boogers. Great, sir. Now, would you like your oil changed or not? Here are only a few games that developers will admit to hating. Chasing a trend in games is almost never a good idea. The industry just moves too fast for the average developer to capitalize before people get bored and move on. After Pong knockoff consoles and filing for bankruptcy, I'd say the first big chase trend in games was the mascot platformer. Mario had proven that knowing who the Jumping Man was did great things for marketing, but it was Sonic the Hedgehog a few years later that really burst the dam. Mario proved that platformers could jumpstart a whole console. Sonic proved that platformers could do it again. The media explosion behind Sonic was unbelievably big. He had almost single-handedly put Sega in striking range of Nintendo and was instantly iconic. But what was it that made Sonic so viral? If we found out, we might be able to make a cure. While Mario was more timeless, Sonic was all 90s. The look, the attitude, the speed. Sega had put together an unstoppable force, and it was only natural a few imitators would sprout up in his wake. Developers were certain that lightning would strike twice, and the floodgates were opened on any adjective and animal-based mishaps. Awesome Possum, Arrow the Acrobat, Radical Rex, it's a family reunion Crash Bandicoot keeps declining the invitation to. If it could run fast and smirk, they'd make a game out of it, and when it comes to knockoffs, none stuck around or got quite as infamous as Bubsy. Aw, who would want to hurt a cute fa- Oh, lots! It turns out lots of people. Bubsy is the hellspawn of Michael Berlin, a writer at the company Accolade who saw great potential in trying to make a game like Sonic. Accolade initially passed on the idea, but after Michael put a report together dissecting what made Sonic a success, Accolade was on board. And it didn't take long to go overboard, as the higher-ups began pinning all their hopes and dreams on Bubsy. Face it, if you were hard up for more Sonic, could you say no? That report clearly impressed higher-ups, since they saw Bubsy as their ticket to the top, something to carry the company and make them a household name. Before the first game was even out, the company had already put the marketing machine behind it, getting a brand deal with Taco Bell, getting an animated pilot produced, and really just overvaluing what Bubsy was worth. 
This promotion style meant that Bubsy needed to succeed or else the company wouldn't have anything left. It even resulted in them going to court with Sega after they reverse engineered Genesis cartridges to sell the game on. And they won! Ultimately, Bubsy did make enough money to have warranted the cost of their marketing efforts, but a lot was different at Accolade after the game launched. For one, Accolade was shaken up by the cost of development on Bubsy and would shelve any more platforms for the time being, choosing to focus on eSports and EVO mainstay 3D balls. One of the games shelved was Bubsy 2, which Michael and his team had worked on in the background of Bubsy's development. Seeing as he couldn't work on the series he created, Michael Berlin would end up leaving Accolade soon after. This created a problem when that Bubsy 2 concept was greenlit without Berlin. Now they had to find someone who was willing to helm the next Bubsy game. And when that failed, they forced lead programmer Sidney Kirkpatrick into the lead role, one that she absolutely hated. After the original game nearly bankrupted the company, it was hard to get excited about doing it again. Coupled with working on someone else's game didn't leave Cindy with many fond things to say about Bubsy. Now, imagine you're Michael Berlin. You're visiting the Accolade offices after they announce Bubsy 2. You're excited to see what a fresh pair of eyes is going to do with your creation. Bubsy plushie upon Bubsy plushie hung from the ceiling in the most harrowing display you've ever seen. And right there, next to the lead programmer for the game, a Bubsy plushie with a pencil shoved through its face. And these weren't common. These plushies aren't just rare now, they were rare then. They were given out to Accolade employees, and the ones that didn't just ignore them would string them up as a warning to anybody else who wanted to make a 2D platformer. The general misery around Accolade during the development of Bubsy 2 extended from the top all the way to the bottom. The team working on the game famously hated Bubsy just as much as Cindy, and would often disregard the quality of the game so they could get back to their lives. The game would sell well, in spite of their best efforts, though noticeably less than the original. Cindy Kirkpatrick, as soon as the game shipped, was not just out of the company, but out of game development altogether. Didn't even wait to see how it performed, just never wanted to take part in another Bubsy 2. Bubsy was now two for two in terms of knocking project leads out of the industry, and it was time for round three, as Accolade signed a deal to become a third-party developer for the Atari Jaguar. Just made my last payments on this bad boy. Sure, it sputters, stalls, and injects me with a, a strange black fluid when I turn it on, but look how many buttons there are. If you've ever started choking and needed to call 911, the Atari Jaguar controller would be such a cruel case of false advertising. The Bubsy burden would be placed on Imagitech, a British gaming company who were mostly responsible for porting games to the Jaguar, and that's exactly what the new Bubsy game was supposed to be, a port of the original. However, producer Farron Thomason had to open his big fat gobber and remind everyone that Bubsy 1 was already old enough to be 15 years off from being able to drive, and people weren't gonna flock to a new console to play a port of an old game. So, a brand new project would be made, Fractured Furry Tales. Despite no developers jumping at the chance to work on a second Bubsy game, and this team being all new people, the exact same result happened and the Bubsy plushy murder rate skyrocketed for the second time in 1994. Very strange how all these got ruled as accidents. The team got annoyed by Bubsy really quickly. It became an inside joke to repeat his lines during development to try to get a rise out of each other. And by the end, a similar view had been taken on the franchise. We do not care about this. We want to forget it ever happened. Please go away. And after selling a paltry 9,000 copies and receiving middling reviews, that's exactly what happened. The team were free from the Bubsy curse and went on to do something else. And did they end up quitting the games industry altogether? Well, Imagitech was bought by Gremlin Interactive, who were bought by Infograms, who died in 2003, so yeah, sure. And from there, Bubsy's story would have a happy ending, right? 
Now, I can't find the same sort of hatred for Bubsy 3D that the other games had, but there was one contributing member to the game who had nothing nice to say. Bubsy himself. Or should I say herself? Lonnie Manella, famous for voicing Rouge from Sonic and Luke from Professor Layton, was also the person who voiced Bubsy in his first 3D outing. It's one of the few roles she's expressed regret for taking, and even said that the direction she was given was to play him as shrilly and annoyingly as possible. Well now, who could have guessed that was a bad idea? But we had to search pretty deep to find out what a bad time these developers had. What if we had a more honest developer, more forthcoming with just how angry their game made them? And what if they didn't even make it? That would really make things better. Now, I've danced this deadly dance before, and at every step, Postal stomped on my foot and called me a pinko. I've learned my lesson. Please enjoy the appropriate B-roll. Postal is one of the most disgusting game franchises ever made. Look at this. I've lost my lunch to this for three days straight. I haven't eaten in days. Please send food. Ugh, Domino's. Starting back in 1997, the Postal series has been going on for 25 years now and has been swimming against the current of common sense and decency ever since. The first game was a success but it wasn't until Postal 2 that the series gained the fandom it has now. Yeah, hard to believe with all the dicks, but this is a lot of people's comfort game. After getting steady support for over five years in the form of DLC packs and fan expansions, the official gears for a third Postal game were put into the works. Now, Postal and 3 aren't two things you see together very often these days, and there's a great reason. The development of Postal 3 was an absolute disaster. Running with scissors, the series developers were hard up for cash at the time and decided to outsource the game to another studio. Russian game developers Akela were eventually picked, as the game development team at Akela, Trashmaster Studios, had previously developed Corkscrew Rules, a Postal expansion that eventually got bundled with some releases. Running with scissors had a good relationship with Akela after letting them publish Postal 2 in Russia and trusted them to program the game while they focused on the writing and design for it. It seemed like they had found the perfect partners. A team of Postal fans with a stupid name was at least two boxes ticked, and there was only one in the first place, so development started. Then 2008 started. Yeah, Ric Flair was retired at WrestleMania 24, and it got worse. The 2008 financial crisis rocked the world at large, and especially Akela, who were suddenly feeling the clamps when it came to finances. In order to keep the lights on, cuts would have to be made to the company somewhere, and the first cut was somehow to the team making their flagship game. That's right, Trash Masters had been fired in the middle of development, but that didn't stop Akela. No, 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 Trash Masters had been divided up into five separate divisions, each one of descending quality. They fired the A team so the B team would be brought in to continue development. But then they were fired too. C team away! No, really, get away, you're fired too. We're running out of letters! Eventually, the D team would get the game into a form where it didn't crash all the time before keeping the combo up and getting fired as well. This game went through four different development teams by the time it hit shelves, and when it did, the stain it left was hard to ignore. Postal 3 is not a functioning game. It's poorly designed, annoying, frustrating, gross, and just unpleasant to be around. People hated the game when they could actually get it to launch, and it's got one of the lowest review scores on Metacritic, with a mere 24 out of 100. Don't worry though, Postal 4 is hot on its trail. Now, that should be where it ends. Postal 3 comes out, but what's it gonna do? Make Postal look bad? Honey, I make bad look worse. What do you think you're gonna do to me? The only people who seemed to hate Postal 3 more than the fans, though, was running with scissors themselves. The fact that they were essentially left holding the bag on a glitchy, unfun mess plastered with their most iconic franchise frustrated them, and after Akela refused to hand over the source code so they could fix it themselves, Running With Scissors chose to tackle the game in 
in its own unique way. If you go to the website and try to learn about Postal 3, it links you to a Rickroll. But if you were to go there before the game's delisting back in 2022, it would say, Postal 3 is a third-person shooter in which you, uh... Um... <sighs> Alright, I'm gonna level with you. Don't buy Postal 3. Seriously, you'd regret it. Hell, you'd regret playing it for free! It's a borderline broken, boring, frustrating, unfinished mess. And there was nothing we could do to stop it. The sad part is that the publisher made little to no effort to fix it themselves, nor did they give us access so that we could try to patch it up for them. We're stuck with Postal 3 as it is. I just want you to consider all of the above before you make the leap of regret into paying real hard-earned money for this title. We don't own this game, we can't support it, and we don't get anything from the sales. So if you decide to risk the purchase, you're on your own. This is already a damning indictment on the game's quality that the store you buy it from is trying to get you to stop but tucked away in a little corner of the website is far too subtle. The hatred for Postal 3's gotta go public. A full 12 years after the launch of the original game, Postal 2 Paradise Lost was released. This was an expansion made over a decade after the game's initial launch, and its whole purpose was to wash the taste of 3 out of people's mouths. The game was absolutely lavished with praise from Postal fans as a return to form, and it wouldn't take long for people to discover just how much was made to burn the memory of 3. When you boot up Paradise Lost, the game immediately starts starts by following up the Apocalypse Weekend expansion, and explains away Postal 3 as the result of a head wound the Postal Dude got at the end of the base game. Completing the DLC unlocks the achievement better than Postal 3, and then there are the two biggest ones in the game itself. Another achievement called Screw That Game is unlocked by going to the junkyard, finding a copy of Postal 3, and doing what you do best. The final middle finger to Postal 3 hidden in the game can be found near the mall in a small abandoned shack. Go upstairs and you'll see the last Postal 3 fan practicing levitation. Honest. In Postal 4, you can find much the same, since burning a pile of Postal 3 copies earns you money and the optional unlock of the skin from Postal 3. And it's with that that I have to mention the one thing they don't hate about Postal 3, Corey Cruz. After Rick Hunter, the regular voice for the Postal Dude, couldn't return for 3 due to personal issues, he recommended Corey Cruz for the role, and... He's not one of the problems with the game, which is enough of an endorsement for me. In the Paradise Lost DLC, a major plot point is the Postal Dude getting a voice in his head, and that voice is Cory's, as the Postal Dude from Postal 3 tries to take over his mind. After that was done and dusted, he would become the main voice of the dude again in Postal Brain Damaged, before finally coming back alongside John St. John, Rick Hunter, even Zack Ward from the movie in Postal 4. It's nice that Running With Scissors was able to take their failure in stride, but what about when a developer can't? A game is ripped away from them and morphed into something he can't recognize, and it still stings well after the process is over. Suda51, to me, is one of the few people you can really call an auteur. Not just a hell of a way to lose a spelling bee, but also someone with a sense of style that can be seen in everything they make. Twilight Syndrome, The Silver Case, Killer7, No More Heroes, he got his hands on Fire Pro Wrestling and instantly made the ending your wrestler killing himself. This man only has one speed and it's car crash fast. That would make it especially interesting when he joined forces with the Resident Evil creator Shinji Mikami and Silent Hill musician Akira Yamaoka to make something really special. A small aside, but Mikami himself would slot into this topic perfectly since he said on multiple occasions he doesn't really care for the first three Resident Evils and sees producing them as a waste of his prime years as a developer. But not everything's about you, Mikami! Go away and make more God Hand! These three would be working on a game idea Suda had based on the works of Franz Kafka, specifically his story The Castle. It was going to be a survival horror game, a whole new realm for Suda, and would be unlike anything else he'd ever made. You would start the game shirtless with only a torch to defend yourself, 
and the danger comes less from massive monsters you need to fight off, and more from the innate fears humans have relating to the dark and the unknown. It sounds a lot like amnesia in that regard, and if the dream team of the father of survival horror, the man who made Silent Hill sound terrifying, and the man I'm more scared of in a general sense were gonna make it, it might be the best horror game ever made. Unfortunately, God or the Devil decided that would be too good for us, and decided to add an unholy counterbalance to make sure Five Nights at Freddy's stood a chance seven years later. Electronic Arts showed interest in the project, like how a lion shows interest in a wounded gazelle and pounced at the opportunity to publish. The only thing they didn't like about it was the game. EA didn't like or understand what the team was going for and refused to sign on if the game was in its current state. The first adjustment they wanted to be made was to give the main character a gun, undoing the original idea entirely by taking away that sense of helplessness. That addition of a gun required the main character to be totally redesigned, moving from this frail and scared-looking character into... Dante, but the coat's purple this time. It's never been purple before! The game, Kurayami, would slowly have every edge sanded off bit by bit until it was barely recognizable as the game Suda intended it to be. What was originally a story set to delve into the problems with the human mind now has a boner joke every couple of feet. Thanks for calling Angel Kiss, sugar. I'm not wearing anything but a smile. <laughs> How about oh you? God, oh my 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 god, Now that is a big boner. Even the small Suda touches he tried to add along the way were denied. In the early stages, after Suda finally added the gun, he wanted to make it unique and different from what had been done before. Enter Paula! She'd have been a small bunny fairy who would have lived inside the gun and acted as Garcia's guide throughout the game. EA executives didn't get it and told him to remove it, so Paula got shifted over to being Garcia's girlfriend who gets captured at the start of the game and doesn't do anything for the rest of it. Moving on up in the world, next week I'm gonna get killed before the prologue. Eventually, everything that made Kurayami the game that it was had been stripped away, most of all that narrative, after an EA executive told Suda about elevator pitches, how films needed to have their plot summarized in an elevator ride or else Hollywood wouldn't use them. Yeah, I was jamming it to some Franz Kafka and thought, man, this is cool and all, but what if it was more like, uh, Mario? Great advice for making movies, bad advice for making games. Games are usually way longer than movies and have a lot more ways to get their messages across. A game like Kurayami would have never really worked as a movie, so why try to pitch it like one? Regardless, Kurayami would eventually mutate into Shadows of the Damned, which, while a fine game on its own, shockingly lacks the real charm of any of the three famous people who helped to make it. Suda especially wasn't really visible in the finished game. Sure, there are weird and crass moments, but not the way he would have made it. Having a big goat monster piss into a cup is wacky and all, but Suda has such a particular way of making things that to see it twisted like this is really obvious. Even with the hardships during development, though, the game would end up reviewing pretty well, but sales-wise, it wouldn't be right to sugarcoat it as anything other than a disaster. The effect of having a game that meant a lot to him ripped away clearly left a mark on Suda, from during the game's release, when he seemed uncharacteristically sheepish during interviews, all the way to the art book that a lot of development information comes from. Shadows of the Damned was clearly a very difficult time for Suda creatively. I don't know if hated is the right term to use when it comes to his feelings on the game, but if what Shinji Mikami has to say is true, it certainly wasn't a happy time. When asked in a PSX Extreme interview if the game Shadows of the Damned ended up being was what he wanted it to be, he said, no, it became a completely different game. It was a bit disappointing. I think Suda was unable to create the scenario he'd originally had in his head, and he rewrote the scenario several times. I think his heart was broken. He's such a unique creator, so it seems to me that he was not quite comfortable with making this game. However, the failures of Shadows of the Damned would end up having a pretty neat benefit. The rights to it were dirt cheap. 
EA sold the rights to the franchise back to Suda's company Grasshopper, and in 2019, we'd get to see more out of Garcia and Johnson. Travis Strikes Again and No More Heroes is a game as much about Travis getting sucked into a game console as it is about Suda51 and his career. Parallels can be drawn all over the place to moments in his career, times in his life, and most importantly, the frustrations he's felt over his career. That all really culminates in the serious Moonlight level. Or at least it would, as the original title of the game is smeared in shit and replaced with Damned Dark Knight. Take whatever meaning you want from that. The entire level is like a venting chamber for Suda to get out his frustrations with the game, using both Travis and the antagonist White Sheepman as stand-ins for his own feelings. Travis is able to see the good in the game and even praise aspects of it he still enjoys, while White Sheepman can only look at the horrible development conditions and hang on to them. Oh, don't think they're being subtle about it. Travis points out specific issues with Shadows of the Damned, like like not being able to carry over weapons between New Game Plus modes. The level itself is even treated as a sorta pseudo-sequel to Shadows of the Damned, with the opening cutscene showing Garcia getting killed by an extremely early design of himself from when the game was still Kurayami, and the living gun Johnson is transformed into the level boss, Eight Hearts. It's a trippy experience to play a game where the developer's own feelings on their entire catalog is so on display, but if anybody would attempt such a thing, it would have to be Suda. It at least seems, though, like this story might have a happy ending. Eight Hearts' boss theme, which is an in-character rap done by his Japanese voice actor because you're still playing a Suda51 game, seems to reflect Suda's own positive feelings towards the game, talking about overcoming the toughest challenges. The level overall shows that even if they're hidden, there are still some positive experiences he associates with Shadows of the Damned. And after all this time, in 2023, Grasshopper even announced a remaster of Shadows of the Damned, set for release next year. It may be his lowest point as a developer, but even then, Suda still found a way to spin it all positively, like no one else could. But what better capstone for this sort of topic than a game development that was so tumultuous, so rotten at the top, that it may be the reason we know what a hellscape modern development is? This is the case of L.A. Noir. Starting development sometime between 2002 and the start of two sentences ago, L.A. Noir was set to be a big game from an untested studio. Team Bondi was an Australian-based game developer headed up by Brendan McNamara, who is the person this whole story revolves around. He was just leaving the UK-based Team Soho after developing The Getaway, one of those PS2 games that sold over 4 million copies but nobody's ever heard of. He would go on to form Team Bondi in the land of Roland Thunder with gold to plunder. From there, a secondary studio would be established, Depth Analysis, a company focusing on motion capture technology. This sort of technology turned all sorts of heads, especially big players like Sony, who agreed to publish the first game they made. They weren't even a game developer by this point. They were just as likely to make baby powder as they were to make Castlevania. 2005 came and put those fears to rest as their first game, L.A. Noir, was announced. A hard-boiled detective story set in ye olden times to be released on the PlayStation 3. While the team was excited about what their game could look like on such cutting-edge tech, they weren't sure what that cutting-edge tech would look like. Sony was selling everybody on a fairy tale when it came to the PlayStation 3. Until their wings melted, there was no telling how high they could fly. Do you think the PS3 will be able to swim? The team had to spend those three years since formation working on the game without much of a clue about how strong the PS3 would be. And when they found out they had overestimated what it was capable of, the whole production had to backpedal to reach back down to what it could do. While they were trying to rein back in their expectations, Sony saw them struggling and thought, 
God, it'd be funny if this got worse, and ended their publishing deal thanks to the game's ballooning budget. Taking a million photos of a person's face for every single NPC in the game costs a lot of money, and the game had a budget that was hard to justify for a studio with no published games. It was then the team's savior, Rockstar Games, would end up picking up the publishing rights. And with a group as big as this backing up the game, things were looking fantastic. From here, the difficulties go from unforeseen consequences totally out of anybody's control to blatantly obvious consequences in one man's control. Almost all of the information comes from anonymous developers recounting their treatment at Team Bondi, compiled in this exhaustive expose done by IGN. It paints an incredibly vivid photo of what happened with this game, and there's more than enough that it could easily fill up an hour of conversation by itself. Something you need to understand before any more discussion is this. Brendan McNamara is a scumbag. He's just not a nice person. Not a single testimonial has a nice thing to say about McNamara, instead calling him an angry, pig-headed bully who would make sure everybody knew when he was unhappy about his project not being exactly what he wanted it to be. Now, there's wanting to get your vision across, and then there's cussing out individual employees in front of everybody after giving them a workload that they were never qualified to deal with. Oftentimes during development, the staff were given tasks that didn't match their skill set. Artists and animators were given insane deadlines to do the impossible. One person who was never bound by a single deadline, though, was McNamara. So eager to show off his shiny new tech, McNamara would take ages to report back any substantial progress being made on the game to Rockstar. The reason being... There was none. The game's development was moving glacially, largely in part to the fact that the door to Team Bondi was a revolving one. Human beings deserve rights. Radical opinion, I know. And it's one that the developers at Team Bondi seem to have agreed with, as they didn't want to put up with McNamara's constant temper tantrums and hissy fits. Over the course of L.A. Noir's development, over 100 employees were churned and burned by McNamara, slowing progress even more as when one person left, someone else had to pick up their slack. The person who got the work after them would spend about a month trying to figure out what any of this was or what it meant, and then after the third or fourth piss or moan from McNamara, they would leave. That left the next person to repeat the cycle all over again. But where were these developers coming from? Well, they weren't popping out of the ground. Worse, really, they were popping out of college. Fresh-faced college employees made up the majority of the development staff at any given time, but not as employees. What do I look like, a business? No, no, these were junior graduates. They had all the responsibility of employees, but get paid a fraction of the amount. Seeing a slave-driving sweatshop set up on the Gold Coast, and, more importantly, no L.A. Noir to show for it, Rockstar decided to step in and lend a hand, giving McNamara some experienced producers to help out. Against all odds, McNamara agreed, and from 2009 all the way up until the day the game was released, L.A. Noir would enter crunch time. Clock in at 7 a.m., clock out at 3. AM. While it wasn't technically a requirement, you were sure to be treated like a second-class citizen if you didn't pull your weight. And the weight of the guy before you. And the guy before him. I saw the mailman outside struggling. What are you, not a team player? But the reward for crunch culture is always the tantalizing and tasty prospect of a bonus at the end, right? Well, McNamara made sure to bungle that too, as it was reported by those same anonymous sources that no overtime was ever paid. A system was allegedly set up that allowed the employees to earn overtime for work done on weekends, but the anonymous sources refuted that saying that no such system existed. And overtime proper could only be earned if you were still at the studio three months after the game was released. So if you wanted to be properly compensated for all your hard work, you had to endure two plus years of verbal abuse, backbreaking labor, and unfair pay just for the chance to try to survive three more months of it. McNamara's response to all this criticism levied against him and his business practices? Well, if you put money on him being rational, I would start running. His answers were all incredibly dismissive of the poor conditions, either chalking them up to how the industry works or that people should have to suffer for their art. 
Hey, I had it just as bad when I was working in your position. Your boss was Brendan McNamara too? It's the classic excuse that because things were bad once, they should always be bad. Why should someone get something that I didn't? I worked grueling hours to get here and I want to know how much fun my old bosses were having. After nearly a decade of pain, L.A. Noir would release to critical and financial success. But strangely, a game that sold 5 million copies was still considered a bit of a bust. By this point in development, Rockstar had sunk over $50 million into the project, and comparing the sales of this to Red Dead Redemption, that extra 10 million copies made a lot of a difference. All of that suffering, all of that crunch time, all 100 of those employees who left the project bitter and angry at the game they made, and Team Bondi shut down four months after the game launched. McNamara, to his credit, didn't learn a goddamn thing after the game had finished and found anyone else to blame but himself. Well, all's awful that ends awful. Working on a project for so long only to end up walking away with a negative feeling about the whole thing, while one of the dangers of the industry, still isn't something you have to be happy about. These are people that, no matter how big the game, want to make the best product they can, and to come out of a project with nothing but disgust is sad. Which is why I will personally never hate anything again. Come here, Donkey Kong, you big lu- I can't do it. <laughs>